DiscerningHearts.com, in cooperation with Tan Books, presents Put on the Armor, a manual for spiritual warfare with Dr. Paul Thickpen. Dr. Thickpen is an internationally known speaker, best-selling author, and award-winning journalist who has published 43 books in a wide variety of genres and subjects, including The Rapture Trap, A Catholic Response to End Times Fever, and The Manual for Spiritual Warfare, the book on which this series is based. In 2008, Dr. Thickpen was appointed by the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops to their National Advisory Council. He has served the Church as a theologian, historian, apologist, evangelist, and catechist in a number of settings, speaking frequently in Catholic and secular media broadcasts and at conferences, seminars, parish missions, and scholarly gatherings. Put on the Armor, a manual for spiritual warfare with Dr. Paul Thickpen. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Well, we've talked about the ordinary. We do need to touch upon the extraordinary demonic activity. Well, this is the kind of stuff that, you know, the Hollywood likes to glorify. It's extraordinary in that it, it really isn't as common as just temptation, which is common to every every man, woman, and child. By extraordinary activity, we're, we're talking about a destructive work that's more powerful and that manifests itself not only in our thought realm, but also in the physical realm. Most observers of demonic tactics agree that there's certain activities that occur. They, they often use different labels for them, and so and I allow for that in my book. I have a certain terminology. There are others who would use a different terminology. The kind of uh, a whole series of levels of activity, each one a little more serious <laughs> than the last, that kind of finds its, its worst form and possession, which is what most people in the world, when they think about demons, that's what they think about. But the first is called infestation. It's demonic activity that's connected to a particular location or an object. So if there's a house, for instance, that's infested, and people often think it's, it's you know, they'll call it ghost or something, but it's actually demonic activity. But folks, uh, witnesses in an infested house may see physical objects moving on their own or seemingly on their own, levitating, flying through the air, disappearing and reappearing in other places. They may smell offensive odors, uh, often like sulfur. They may hear noises they can't explain, like crashes or laughter or screaming. So when people talk about you know, a haunted house, often that's what we're talking about, something where there's a demonic association with that building or that location. The next level then is, is what I would call oppression. It describes demonic attacks on a, a victim's exterior life. So it may be influences on their bodily health, influences on their finances, on their work situation, on their family relations and other social rela- relations. In some severe cases, it may even include physical assaults, invisible blows to the body, um, a push out of bed or downstairs, mysterious scratches appearing on the skin. I've seen all of these before. A number of saints throughout the ages have spoken about enduring this kind of thing. So St. Anthony of the Desert, St. Teresa of Avila, St. John Vianney, Padre Pio, St. Pio of Pietrelcina, a few of those. Next then would be obsession. That refers to a more severe and relentless form of the struggle in the victim's interior life. It's a, it's a wrestling with disturbing thoughts planted by the enemy, and but to a degree not just temptation. So it, it's an inner torment that can be suffered while you're awake or in nightmares. becomes so intense that the sufferer may seem to be going insane to themselves and to others. There may be visual and auditory hallucinations, persistent temptations to suicide. We have to note that symptoms like this may well have physical causes and mental causes rather than spiritual ones. That's why the church is always careful and insists that those who experience these kinds of afflictions should first approach medical professionals for help before just instead of just concluding that they're under attack from evil spirits. But then the most serious is, is possession, the one that's most dangerous and most rare form of, of extraordinary demonic activity. It involves periodic episodes in which an evil spirit controls the body of the victim, though the victim is usually not aware of what's taking place during that control. And we have several accounts of that in the Gospels, as we've, we've talked about before. So the demon-possessed person may, may engage in bizarre bodily contortions that would normally be impossible. The body may levitate or act with superhuman strength. The victim may groan, hiss, make animal sounds, and an alien voice may speak through the possessed person, sometimes without even the use of their vocal cords. Uh, often they reveal knowledge of hidden things, or they talk in a language unknown to the victim the victim has never studied. And at the same time, as in cases of infestation, often disturbing and, and even violent physical phenomena may take place in the victim's presence. 
And then finally, the victim of demon possession exhibits a, an extreme, sometimes violent, sense of revulsion to holy things, like the name of Mary and the name of Jesus, to the rites of the church, to a consecrated host, to sacred relics, to sacramentals such as holy water. So that would be the most most serious thing. I, and I always like to make the point that a demon can never possess someone in the sense of owning that person, because all human beings, no matter what they've been through or what they've done, all human beings belong to God. They are his personal possession. But we speak of cases of demonic possession in, in which the enemy has basically become a usurper, occupying the human body that was created to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit instead. Now, one of the reasons why we are going over, again, this particular part of our conversation is to know the battle. And it doesn't necessarily mean that we're called to be the Navy SEALs yes. <laughs> that are called to go out there and engage in, and it, okay, now we know what it is, so we're going to go out and deal with it. It's important, as you said, at certain levels that, yes, medical professionals absolutely have to be working in relationship with a person afflicted. In many cases now, Paul, isn't it true that in dioceses around the United States, as well as around the world, that if there are those who feel that they are encountering this, that they can go to the chancery or maybe even to the local parish, and they will be able to work together to help bring that person once again to wholeness. Yes, and that's so important. I mean, if you're at the place where you're you know, your sense is that it's it's beyond the ordinary and these other things. It's a, you, you find a priest that you're confident in and you know, as you trust and, you know, lay it before them. If you have to go to several priests, but, but go and give them a chance to help you figure out if it may be something else than what, you know, what you're thinking. They can re- make references, refer you to, to medical professionals who can help you to kind of rule those things out. And the church won't allow you to go to, through something, you know, a major exorcism without having kind of ruled out the other things. But the church is there, resources are there to help you. The, our Lord Jesus, who cast out demons very easily, <laughs> has given his authority to them. And powers don't always come out with just a word because there are complex situations that involve kind of healing that has to go on in the soul and sometimes a renunciation of certain things before it can all happen. But completely, if you have a trained exorcist, they'll know what to do. So the church has that help and go to the church for sure. While well, I'm meeting more and more folks who, you know, are, well, I hear there's this spiritual healer, you know, and often it's someone who's not even of a Christian background, but some kind of new agey thing. You know, you don't want to go that direction because folks who don't have the authority that Christ gave to, you know, leaders of his church, they can just get you into worse trouble than ever. Yeah, you can look at the scriptures for an example. The one that jumps in my mind is Saul. Mm. King Saul, Mm -hmm. when he chose to go to an oracle because he was feeling, uh, can we say maybe oppressed or something like that? I'm not trying to diagnose the situation, but uh, to the point where he went to the oracle to summon up Samuel, and it, Mm -hmm. it ended up leading to not only her madness but to his. Well, it's just a, it's a very dangerous thing. Like I said, you know, in the book of Acts, you know, the other example where you've got the sons, seven sons of Siva who fancy themselves exorcists and they see St. Paul casting out demons and they say, okay, well, they go up to <laughs> this person and, you know, cast you out in the name of Paul or Jesus or whatever name they used. And, and the thing just looks at them and you, know, you can just hear the smirk in the words and say, uh, Paul, I know, and Jesus, I know, but who are you? <laughs> and then jumps on them, you know. But but especially folks, you know, kind of occult healers and that kind of thing. There's certain cultures that, you know, just have a tradition of this. It's extremely dangerous. Sometimes, you know, people accuse Jesus of casting out demons by the prince of demons. And in this case, it's almost like that, that they're not really casting them out, but by they themselves can be demonically influenced in a way that will, you know, if there's actually a demonic power that's somehow oppressing someone and they go to one of these healers who's actually demonically connected – yeah, that person can appeal to the demon, lay off of them for a while. And they'll seem to think, you know, they'll look like maybe they've been healed or helped. It's the wrong way to go about it because it's not it's not the authority of Jesus that's overcoming the thing. It's it's just, a, you know, orders from, from a higher demon, <laughs> so to speak. You have to be really careful. And I think it, it needs to be said too here, I hope you agree, Paul, that as we spoke about the ordinary activity that of temptation that is done, that even in the this extraordinary activity, the demonic activity, that 
train exorcists will say that there it usually begins with an entry point a de, you know a demonic entry point there is a point in which it's not necessarily where the, the guy is just walking down the street and all of a sudden boom this happens to him there it, it, i'm not going to say that it can happen that way but m- most of the time the overwhelming majority of the time it's because there is some type of activity, whether it was an assault as as a child, or it's something that the person agreed to participate in. It might be a violent act that was perpetrated. There's usually some moment uh, or a series of moments where this activity enters into the person's life, and then it manifests itself into a greater situation. And that's when those who are trained in this area are able to to untie those knots to get to those layers. Am I presenting that properly? Yeah, I think so. And I, I, I'm certainly no expert in exorcism and I've never trained and I, I'm not a priest, so I couldn't be an exorcist. But I hear the same thing from those who are trained that that often there is some particular point of access. And again, it's not necessarily that the person makes a choice to do something, but something could be done to them. Or they could even just move into a house that is infested for whatever reason because there's some earlier resident called some of the powers and in, you know into there by what they did maybe the Ouija board or something who knows but and that's why too you do need you know some trained folks because they it's not just so simple as snap my fingers the devil's gone you know there's certain kind of principles that seems to be of, of of demonic activity like that 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 an exorcist is trained to to look at to understand and to begin to as you say untie the knot because these things usually are complicated knots because you. You still need the will of the victim to cooperate with what's going on. There needs to be some part of them that is saying, I want to be free of this, and I will do what I need to to be free of this. And if it means renouncing um, what I did you know, by going to that channeler or going to that Ouija board or whatever, or if it means forgiving this person who did this to me or as a part of it, or if it means forgiving myself, making reparation in something – some demonstration that my will is to do the will of God and to be free. Uh, you know, it always gets to me that that one time, I don't want to read too much in it, but in the gospel, where there's a man who had been, been ill all of his life, you know, he's uh, lame all his life, and, and Jesus looks at him and says, do you want to be healed? And that's always struck me that sometimes that's a question he has to ask us through the priest, through the counselor, through the exorcist, if we go that far. Do you want to be healed? because it's going to require some cooperation on your part. When we go back to those who are trained, it essentially finds its roots in the fact that our Lord established a certain order. He established authority. So for the church, it is passed down through the bishops. And the bishops then, in this particular case, appoint priests who are trained and are the ones who have the authority to be able to vanquish and to be able to engage in. And it is not something that is necessarily a activity that all of us are called to be uh, engaged in. And, you know, and, and that's that's the wisdom of God and the wisdom of the church. The uh, We're not all able to, we don't have the minds for it. We don't all have the experience for it. There are a lot of us walking around with our own wounds that if we were to, to try to do an exorcism, that would, you know, could make it very complicated if we had the same kind of problem and still, you know, still struggling with it. I mean, there are all kinds of reasons why it's wise for the church to train and appoint people to do this rather than any one of us just saying, well, okay, you know, here's somebody who seems to have a problem with possession. I'm going to speak to that demon. <laughs> It's, it's just wise because we really aren't all equipped for the worst kinds of battles. There's certain things we're equipped with. We've all got the name of Jesus. We've all got the scripture. We've got prayer. We've got um, you know the rosary. I've got – in the book, I've got an entire rosary, all the reflections for all the mysteries of the rosary, specifically with spiritual warfare, some wonderful prayers that we can pray. There's all kinds of stuff we can do, but there are certain things when you get to a certain point where you need you need the authority. I remember when when the the centurion, you know, came to Jesus and he wanted Jesus to heal his son, 
And Jesus was going to come to his house, and he said, you don't even have to come to my house. Just say the word. And he said, I, too, am a man under authority. And when I say go to this one, he goes. And when I say go to that one, he goes. What great faith. But he understood, as a soldier, he understood the issue of authority, that Jesus could do this, could heal and, and implicitly cast out demons too, not just because he was a good man or because people liked him, or, but because he had the authority of God. And because he had the authority, he could do it. Christ gave that authority to the church, and the church you know, appoints folks forth that have been trained. And even then, I mean, exorcists will tell you, even then, oh my goodness, some of the struggles they have, if those folks who are so holy and so well-trained and they know this stuff and they're discerning, if they have some of the struggles that come against them, what would happen to someone like you or me if we were to try to do the same? Well, it, it goes all the way back to the, the beauty of the virtue of humility. Mm-hmm. It is, uh, I'm recalling the psalm, be still and know that I am God. Yes. Sometimes we just have to stop and be little and let him fight the battle. And it may be through those who have been appointed through the church that he's established here, this church militant, to be able to do that. And the reason I emphasize that is because it can be very subtle trap that we can fall into if, if we think that, well, I have the words, I know what to say, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to do this for my friend down the street, or I'm going to engage in something when we don't see that maybe, just maybe, the motivation for our behavior is spiritual pride. That is a very, very dangerous trap, isn't it, Paul? It is. Like I said, again and again, you know, the, the, the fathers and mothers of the, of the desert and the ancient church, they, they said that, that pride is the thing that will trip you up with the devil sooner than anything else. They, saint Anthony of the desert, you know, wonderful saint, and one of the fathers of the monastic movement, one time he had a vision. And he saw traps laid out all over, you know, you could hardly move without encountering a trap of the devil. And and he cries out to God in prayer. He says, Lord, all these traps of the devil, who can get past them? How can you even move past them? And and the Lord answered him, you know, that humility is what will get you past them. And this is this wonderful image of a trap. That's kind of you know just off the ground, and humility is it's related to our word humus, dirt. You know, um, humility means to, to lowliness, among other things. And so it's this image of the person who wants to get past all these traps of the enemy. If he lowers himself, if he humbles himself, and he keeps close to the ground, and moves you know maneuvers that way, he'll pass right under every one of them, and they won't catch him. What a powerful image that that we need. Humility, pride of any kind, but especially spiritual pride. Well, the enemy will use that to bait us and bring us in hook, line, and sinker. Oh, my goodness. And we'll talk about that in in our future conversations. You have a whole chapter four in, in Know Your Weapons in the, the wonderful manual for spiritual warfare. But we should mention, too, that in dealing with both the ordinary and extraordinary demonic activity, it doesn't always call for exorcism. There are things that Catholics can do to help them. And this is, you know, incredibly positive, the wonderful deliverance prayers that have been used as a remedy for, for many, 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 many years, if not centuries, in the Church. And, you know, the, the supreme deliverance prayer is actually our Father, the Lord's Prayer. When he says, deliver us from evil— the, that could also be translated, the Greek there can be translated the evil one. It's the same, you know, same words. So deliver us from the evil one. So he's showing us in the model prayer that that's something we should be praying and that we can pray. And so we do, we do have the authority in our own lives you know, to, to resist the enemy, to rebuke him, to surround ourselves with praise and thanksgiving, which is like a shield against uh, the demon's temptations. And um, and I'm sure we'll you know talk more another time too about all the the sacraments that we have. Every one of the sacraments, every one of the seven sacraments has a particular role to play in spiritual warfare. The sacramentals do because they're joined to the prayers of the church, which makes them very powerful. Um, we've got worship, we've got fasting, we've got Eucharistic adoration, we've got prayer, scripture, and so many things. So God hasn't left us with empty hands in this war. He's He's given us all kinds of incredible weapons, and and equipment.
Scriptural Prayers for Deliverance, as found in the Manual for Spiritual Warfare. Psalm 31, verses 1 to 5. O Lord, how many are my foes! Many are rising against me. Many are saying of me, There is no help from him in God. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and a lifter of my head. I cry aloud to the Lord, and he answers me from his holy mountain. I lie down and sleep. I wake again, for the Lord sustains me. I am not afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, deliver me, O my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Deliverance belongs to the Lord, your blessing upon your people. In you, O Lord, I seek refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. Yes, you are my rock and my fortress. For your namesake lead me and guide me. Take me out of the net which is hidden for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. I just can't emphasize the importance enough of the sacraments of the church. I've heard it said more often than not, just one good confession is better than a hundred exorcisms. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's such, there's such power in that. The Eucharist of St. John Chrysostom just writes so beautifully about that, and that it's a representation of the sacrifice of the cross. The moment Jesus said, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit, and he, his life was given up as that sacrifice for us, that was the devil's defeat. You know? And then it was manifest even more in the resurrection, but that was the thing that overturned the works of the devil. That, that Christ came into the world to defeat the devil, the works of the devil. And so, the demons hate it. I mean, first of all, they hate it because it's the presence of Christ, and they're terrified of it. But second, they hate it because it's putting right, and you know, rubbing their noses in the thing that, that defeated them, in the thing that, that overturned all their plans and humiliated them most. And so, St. John Chrysostom says, you know, think about that. When you go to receive communion, think about that. And that you have this Christ that they're terrified of, you've taken him into yourself now. And he has this beautiful image. He says, when you turn around and come back from the altar, you should see yourself as lions breathing fire. Wow. How powerful. The devil's got to run from that. There is one area as far as deliverance prayers, which, uh, again, we're going to be talking more and more about those and uh, and all those different varied forms, and which are beautifully outlined in the Manual of Spiritual Warfare. But there is a, an important distinction about, particularly for lay people, there there is two types of prayer, ones that are directed, those that are asking God's protection from evil, and those that are spoken to demons. We need to understand the difference between those two and why one is very dangerous. Yeah, the, traditionally we, we speak of deprecative prayers. Uh, those are the ones that seek to prote- protect us from evil by invoking God's power. So, great example, script, scriptural example of that in the book of Jude where he talks about how when St. Michael was disputing with the devil, he said, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. He's basically, I mean, he's speaking to the devil, but even then, he's, he's calling down God's power. So it's asking for God's power to, to help. But imperative prayers spoken to demons, they issue a, a direct summons or an adjuration or, or, or command to them. So if we're, if we're praying for ourselves, we can pray both kinds uh, of, a certain, of a certain type. But we're never, the church is very clear, we're never to kind of get into this, di- try to get into a dialogue with a, a demon. If, if something is speaking to us through the other, we don't demand, okay, tell me your name and how many of you are. That's that's something for the exorcist to do. But when we're praying for ourselves or for someone who is our responsibility, you know, a member of our family, especially one of our children, then we can, as I understand it, we can pray that kind of imperative, um, Satan, be gone, 
resist you in the name of Jesus and, and use his name. But when we're talking about praying for other people who are not uh, under our personal kind of authority or responsibility, we shouldn't be addressing the demon directly, is my understanding. I mean, it's not my rule. It's, it's what I'm hearing from authorities in the church and especially from exorcists. Those who have been listening to us have heard us say the importance of understanding authority and order, that it's because the same God that creates the order of creation and of the universe and sets the sun and the stars and the sky and everything else, he established an order in the church from the father to the son, to the bishops, then to the priest. When the priest speaks in that particular prayer to the demon, that order, it's as if the father is speaking through them and the demon submits. But anyone who speaks out of that is not in order, that is speaking outside of authority, that may even be experiencing spiritual pride, speaks to that. There is no recognition by the demonic. And if anything, that opens them up, the person who is saying those things, to a greater assault, because the authority is not there. It's authority is the critical issue there, and 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 my all priests can pray what are called minor exorcisms of certain kinds. There's even a manual of minor exorcisms, minor exorcisms they can use. So the priests have that authority, and then, as we said, but in you know very serious cases that may actually be possession or that kind of thing, even then it's limited to appointed exorcists. But for all the reasons we've mentioned already, it's the church doesn't just kind of throw the doors open and say, okay, anybody who wants to do it could do it because there's so many things involved that uh, you have to have wisdom, you have to have discernment, you have to have the armor in place on yourself So because the enemy will try to come after the, the person who's, um, who's praying and find their weak spot. In so many ways, the, the responsibility has to go along with the authority. I love the way one of the priests you know, said to me, uh, Chad Ripperger, that the reason a priest has that authority in a sense is that the, the authority that's been given to him is to be a father, kind of for all the flock. So just as a father can pray prayers for his children of this sort, the priest can pray prayers for all of us of that sort because it's kind of the, it's part of the authority of his fatherhood. And that's a beautiful way to look at it. Yeah, that's uh, that's something I think is very important to bring forward. And, and you also have prayers in the Manual for Spiritual Warfare is that in our households, in the domestic church, there is is an authority given into those who are the heads of the household, whether there's a father present, he is the head of the household, so there are prayers that are said, and even the, the church offers blessings and prayers. And in the case that maybe a father is not present, then the mother would assume that role, but again, it goes back to authority and order, and through that, uh, the Holy Spirit works in helping to protect and to f- help us fight that battle. Someone has pointed out before that, that Satan's first attack on, on the human race was to attack a family. He attacked the married couple. He separated the wife from the husband, basically, and then you know used that relationship for the husband to fall as well. And that's always been a major part of his strategy is to go after the family. John Paul II, he said, as the family goes, so goes the world. Well, we've talked about so much in this particular conversation, Paul, to understand, to know the battle. Any final thoughts? Well, I would say, again, not to be afraid. Even if uh, someone should believe or or sense or or worry that, be anxious that maybe some of the extraordinary stuff is beginning to happen, make use of the resources that God gives us through the church and have hope in him. He's, He's greater than the devil. He won't allow anything to happen to you that uh, he can't bring a greater good out of. At the risk of sounding self-serving, I would say, please read this manual for spiritual warfare. Read other books, too, that can help you that way. Read especially the scripture. And and the more you can discern and understand, the, the better position you'll be in to resist the enemy's assault. The Renewal of Baptismal Promises, as found in the Manual for Spiritual Warfare. O Lord my God, this day I renew my baptismal promises. I renounce sin so that I can live in freedom as a child of God. I renounce the snares of evil so that sin cannot enslave me. I renounce Satan and all his works and all his pomps. 
I take Jesus Christ for my deliverer and my champion, my model and my guide. I promise to serve him faithfully, whatever the cost, to the end of my life, so that I can share in his everlasting triumph. Amen. You've been listening to Put on the Armor, a manual for spiritual warfare with Dr. Paul Thigpen. To hear and or to download this episode along with many others, go to discerninghearts.com. To obtain a copy of A Manual for Spiritual Warfare, go to tanbooks.com, the website for its publisher, Tan Books. This has been a production of discerninghearts.com in cooperation with Tan Books. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Join us next time for Put on the Armor, A Manual for Spiritual Warfare with Dr. Paul Thickpen.